We've, uh, we've been in a series um, in the month of January called, called Up, right? And we've talked about what it means to be a disciple. And, uh, and, and we're, going, we're going deep into 2016. And we're not, we're not uh, just settling and saying, all right, that's it. No, it's just like coast for the rest of the year, right? <laughs> like I, I want us to, as a church, and for you personally, to go further, all right? And this year, we're calling 2016 the year of community, meaning we want to see people connected relationally in a way that we've never seen in the life of our church. We've seen pockets of it. We've seen times and seasons of it. But, but I know biblically, I know like through the Holy Spirit, and I know through the book of Acts, and when we see the early church, that there's more. There's, there's so much more. And our culture pushes against the more of what God wants for us, and there's a lot of roadblocks and barriers that, that are put in front of us, but then there's freedom when we walk into God's word, right? There's freedom when we walk into obedience to what he has. And so we're going to figure this out. And, uh, and, and it's going to take a little bit of time, and we're going to start to lay the foundation this morning of, of community, of, of what, is it, what is a picture of true community? What does it look like to really experience this? Um, and so we've got, I don't know, we've got an entire year to figure it out. I'm just going to preach the same message every, every Sunday for the next year. There's been seasons I felt like doing that, just preaching the same sermon every week until everybody got it, right? Until it's like, okay, I finally get it. No, anyways, I'm not going to do that. So you can come back next week. It'll be different. It'll be better and it'll be deeper. Um, but we're learning what does it mean to be a disciple? And you're going to see this a lot. Why? Because I want you to remember it. Because I want it to become a part of your language, right? And our language as a church This is what we've been learning a disciple is. Read this with me. Ready? Disciple is someone who is surrendered to God, changed by the Holy Spirit, and living as Jesus. Now, if you didn't join us during the last series, go back and watch all these sermons because they were good. They were were good when we really unpacked what these things mean and what they look like. Um, Last Sunday, we talked about what a disciple does then to start looking like this, and what does the journey of life look like? And if you remember this big fancy word, progressive sanctification. Let's say that together. Progressive sanctification. It's fancy. And it, it, it means that we are designed and wired to go through a process of growth and change our entire life until we see Jesus. That, that, that the Holy Spirit is transforming us and making us more holy, which means making us more into the image of Christ himself, and in that journey, it looks like a roller coaster. <laughs> we, have, we have our ups and things are great and then something comes into our life, sin or a trial, and then we feel like, what in the world is going on? And we feel a downhill in life. And it's important what we do in that process to find new truth, apply new truth, transform our mind, uh, confess, and then continue to put off the old self and put on the new, right? We talked about that last week. Was that good for you guys? I'm just wondering, okay, I, for, I was hoping for some of you that would be an aha moment of, oh, that's why I felt that way during that one season, <laughs> or that's why I feel this way now, you know, whatever it might be. Um, so if you missed last week, I want to encourage you, you need to go back. It's, it, for, for what I believe of what we've done over the last four weeks is really set the foundation of what it means to be a, a disciple. I mean, what does it mean to be this, this Christ follower? Like, what is, how does even this work? Well, well, we're going to go a next step in this of figuring out what it means to be a disciple because we're talking about the difference between coming to church and being the church. It's easy to come to church, right? When you use that language, you say, oh, I'm going to go to church this Sunday. It means you're coming to a one-hour time slot or two if you come and serve one and then come to, to the second or however it might be, um, and then you're going to go home. That's what it looks like to come to church, right? It's come, experience, go. Come, experience, go. Come, experience, go. And, and just so you know, we do that every week. <laughs> Sundays come with great regularity. Did you know that? Like, <laughs> seems like they're always happening Sundays. Um, but it's different to, to, instead of just coming to church and then going home, it's a lot different being the church. And sometimes we mess up the two. And we get confused about what coming to church and thinking that's a part of being the church, which is a part of it, um, but the being the church is, is a much bigger thing. It's a much bigger thing that we need to understand biblically. Um, when we're thinking about being connected relationally, I tell you what, our culture today, it's, it's tricky. 
this is a tricky culture. We're, we're the most connected culture that's ever existed on the planet, meaning like you can be connected to people all across this planet, right? And you can be connected to people that you were connected to years and years and years ago and then find them again online and then connect with them and say, hey, how's it going? And have some superficial conversations. And then, and then you can be connected with a lot of people all at the same time. But the problem is I think we're virtually connected, but actually in reality, relationally starved Amen. as a society. Um, and so as, a, as what it means to be the church, we're actually going to be pushing way against the culture right now. We're, we're, going, to be, we're going to be pushing against some things that we naturally do because it's where we live and who we're next to. Um, and so we, we got to put on the new self and put off the old. We got to put on some new habits and take off the old habits and, and, and be community. Um, we're no longer a front porch society. You know, a few generations ago, uh, you go to communities and towns anywhere, it was a front porch community. You know, everybody had to be on their front porch because they didn't have air conditioning. So in the evening, they were cooling themselves on the front porch and it was the neighborhood conversation. Hey, how's it going? Good. And they'd go over and they'd spend an hour just chatting and talk. Like, we don't live in that time anymore, unfortunately. Our front porch is Facebook, which is not a front porch. Um, it's, it's actually one of the most narcissistic creations that could have ever been, I think. Where, hey, look at me, look what I'm eating. You know, I don't care. Like, <laughs> looks good, but I can't eat it right now, so why are you sharing it? Anyways, <laughs> you guys know what I'm talking about. Anyway, so, so we need to figure out <laughs> when we live in actually the most narcissistic culture and the most narcissistic time that's ever existed on the planet where we know everything but actually are connected literally. That's not a word, but listen to what I'm saying. We need to figure out how to do this in the church. We need to figure out how to be the church. Uh, because when life goes to crap, when life goes sideways, when we're talking about being the church, right? Th- this is my main point, all right? And this is a really good one. So write it down. See, when life goes sideways, you don't need a sermon. You need a someone. Let's go home now, all right? Because my sermons obviously don't do anything, right? Like, when really, when life goes sideways... When, when things are, you know, your, your marriage is a wreck and you're trying to figure out what in the world's going on and the D word's just flown through your head like, I just want to tap out of this marriage. I just want a divorce. I want to get over with it. If you come and listen to a sermon, it's not going to fix anything in your life. You don't need a sermon. You need a someone. You need some people beside you saying, whoa, whoa, let's walk through this together. This is going to be messy. This is going to be gross. Um, but we want to be in community. We want to walk beside you. When, when, when your work life sucks... Yes, you can blast it on Facebook, but then all you sound like is a whiner with the rest of the people who are whining about the things they don't like. You don't need a platform to announce it. You need someone beside you to encourage you through it, right? You don't need a sermon. You need a someone. And, and we need to figure out where are those someones in your life who will walk beside you in the process of becoming a disciple, putting off the old self and putting on the new and finding out where the lies are that you're believing and where's the truth that you need to put on in your life. That's what you need, right? And tr- it, like all of you are like, yeah, 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 but you don't want it. And that's why we're going to go through this for the next month or so because I can't fix this in one sermon. I can't tell you, this is how you want it and this is what you don't do. <laughs> I wish it worked that easily. I just know there's things that I got to work out. There's things you got to work out. There's things we need to understand biblically. Let's figure out how to not just fix each other with a sermon, but how can we find the someones around us so that we can really understand what, um, what this whole idea of community looks like. So if you have a Bible, <clears throat> last week we were in Ephesians chapter 4. This week we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to hang out in the same chapter. Um, this is probably my favorite chapter in the whole Bible because I, if you just read this chapter, you could figure out what it means to, to do this whole disciple thing, okay? The second half, last week, the second half was what it looked like to be a, a disciple of like putting off the old self, putting on the new, the process of growing and change and becoming more like Christ, right? That's what we talked about last week in the second half of chapter four. The first half of chapter four is hugely important because it comes before the second half for a reason because it spells some things for us that we need to understand in order to experience the second half what it what it looks like to grow and change so we're going to read the first uh, part of ephesians chapter four and we're going to just 
this is just introduction, so we're not going to go super, 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 super deep into it, but I need to just paint the picture for you, okay? So let's get into Ephesians chapter 4, and if you have it and you're with me, say, yep. yep. Awesome. So here we go. And if, if you're new to New Hope and you don't have a Bible, I say this every week because we always have new people here, we have Bibles in the baskets right there as you walk in, Bibles out on the uh, Welcome Center, Info Center. Grab one, take it home with you, put your name on the inside of it, it's yours, all right? We just, it's our gift to you. It's important for you to read it on your own. That's, that's what it means to be a disciple. It's to get into God's word on your own and, and let God speak to you through it. Um, so this is, this is what it says here in Ephesians 4, starting in verse 1. This is Paul talking to the Ephesians, and he says, As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. It says, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. What does everything have as existence through? It is God. God is in all, of all, through all, like God is, he's all. He, he's the big all, okay? Now these first few verses give us a picture of some things that we're called to, right? You'd see this phrase a lot through this. You're called to this, you're called to that. There's a calling in you. And so we, we, he's challenged us. We have to live a life worthy of the calling you received. And then the very next verse, in that calling, he talks about being completely humble and gentle, being patient, bearing with who? One another in love. The very next verse, he talks about community. He talks about being relationally connected as a body, right? That that you were called to be connected. You were called to be humble and gentle and patient and bearing with one another. Have you ever had to bear with one another? Like, like you wish you wanted to bear on them, but it's like you just have to like, all right. God knew we weren't going to be perfect and that like we needed to hear that word. Like sometimes we just have to bear with one another. Be patient, be humble, right? He keeps on saying it, stuff like this, like have unity of the Spirit, capital S, Spirit. The Holy Spirit always will call to unity. He will. The Holy Spirit is not um, a spirit of disunity. The Holy Spirit is not one that brings conflict and, and, and separation of the body of Christ. That's never what the Holy Spirit is doing. The Holy Spirit is always bringing unity. How do you have unity in, if you don't have relationship? You can't, right? It's implied to have unity. You have relationship because that's what you're called to, to be connected. So there is how many bodies? One body. Now, we're going to look at that a little bit in the second part of this. But I just want to set the foundation here. You were called to community. You were wired and designed for relationship. It's in you. But there's brokenness and sin and wounds that continually push against that, right? Because we felt some of the hurts of relationships. We felt those times where we had to bear with somebody. We, we, we experienced the frustrations and the hurts and the hangups because people wounded us or we wounded them and now we walk with guilt. We can't let those things, and we're gonna look at those things over the next few months or the next number of weeks, we can't let those things be the hindrance of the calling that is on us as a disciple of Christ to be in unity, to be connected, to be relationally connected. We see this all throughout the scripture, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna read these real quick to you, okay? Because in, in just the New Testament, this is what we see all through, we see these, what I call the one another's of the Bible, where we're called to do something with or for one another, and, uh, and so you can write these down if you want, if you have like super fast and it's going to smoke when you start writing. Because here's all the love, all the one another's that we see in scripture in the book of John. We're supposed to love one another. We're supposed to wash one another's feet. That's awkward, right? Like that's just the idea of serving each other, right? Like you need to be humbly serving. 
In Romans, be devoted to one another. Give preference to one another in honor. Live in harmony with one another. Do not judge one another. Accept one another. In Corinthians, it says, agree with one another. There should be no divisions among you. That same thing. There's, we don't have a spirit of division, spirit of unity. Wait for one another. Have equal concern for one another. In Galatians, it says, serve one another. Do not provoke or, or envy one another. Bear one another's burdens. And then in Ephesians, where we're reading now, show forbearance to one another, build up one another, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgive one another, speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, which is cool because we do that on Sundays. But we should also do that in community, in small things. Anyways, I could preach a sermon for every single one of these, but I don't have time. In Ephesians, again, submit to one another. Do not lie to each other. Teach and admonish with all wisdom. Thessalonians, encourage one another, build each other up, be kind to one another. Hebrews, stimulate one another to love and good deeds. The book of James says, do not speak against one another. Don't complain against one another. Confess your sins to one another and pray for each other. Uh Uh-oh, shut your mouth, right? Like, I ain't confessed to one another. Ooh, that's messy. First Peter, keep fervent in your love for one another. Be hospitable without grumbling. (laughs) The Bible's so right on, just so you know. Like, have you ever been hospitable, been like, why are they coming over? You know, like, (laughs) all right. Some of you small group leaders in this room, you're like, "Mm, I had to clean my house for this. What? Anyways, and then it says, clothe yourself with humility toward one another. I could spend an hour just proving to you, right, that, that we're called to be with one another. That's how we're wired. That's how we're designed. That's how God made us. And, uh, and that's what he desires. Why the heck don't we do it? You know, why, why do we push against it? Um, let's keep reading, okay? Let's, uh, we're going to skip down to verse 14 now. Because then, then there's some new language and some new imagery of what it means to be connected. He talks about, before we get to this, he talks about the role of a pastor. If you want to read that, you can. It's to actually equip the saints to do good works, right? That's, that's the role, so that we're all together, serving together, using what God gave us together. And when that is accomplished, then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of the people in their deceitful scheming. Have you ever felt that in your life? Verse 15, instead of that, right? Speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. They start painting this imagery that that instead of being infants, being tossed back and forth, experiencing all this crazy stuff, we're going to speak the truth in love with each other, right? And then we're going to grow to be a mature body. Now, a body needs a head, right? Like, my body without my head is dead meat, right? Like, I, I just, you can't exist without a head. And so, if we are going to be a body, we have to have a head. The head is Christ. Christ is the head of the church. And I'm not saying, like, he's the head of New Hope. He is, but he's the head of the church. Like, across this whole planet today, Billions of people worshiping Jesus, the head of the church. From him, Jesus, the head, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. The head is active in this process. The whole body is being joined together. It's supporting. It's growing. It's building itself up as what? Each part does its work. It's active. A body that's not active gets fat and lazy. A body who is active and moving gets stronger and more powerful, right? And we're using this imagery of the body of Christ 
as Christ is the head, we, we need to understand that, that we are called to be connected to that body. We are. And in that process of being connected to that body, there are some things that will happen. One, we will no longer be infants. We will be speaking the truth in love. We will be growing. We will become mature. Right? We'll be growing. We'll be building the whole body, working together. There's some good stuff. There's some good fruit that comes out of actually living the way God called us to live. And, uh, and we need it. So here's what I'm saying. When it comes to this whole being connected in community and relationship with people who are part of your church, right, your community, um, there isn't an A or B choice box. Like, I'm a, I'm a disciple of Christ. Um, mark which one you want. A, to be relationally connected with people, or B, just to do this by myself. There is no B in the scriptures. It doesn't exist. Because if, if you are disconnected from the body, <laughs> well, let me ask you this question. <laughs> this is kind of graphic, but I've kind of already said it. I didn't mean to say it, but like, what is a body part that's disconnected from the body? It is dead meat, right? <laughs> Like, if my hand is cut off and no longer connected to the rest of my body and it's over there somewhere, the longer it is disconnected from my body, the more gross it actually gets, right? And the more, like, this is gruesome. But there are some people who think they're Christians who are chopped themselves off from the body and their life is not looking all that what God called them to look like because they've amputated themselves from the calling that God put on them, which is to be relationally connected. There's another piece of this. A body part disconnected from the spiritual body is also dead meat for a different reason, and it's a spiritual reason. If you're unconnected, you're dead meat. Your enemy is, right? The enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. This passage right here, the words in it have a very specific meaning. Do you know how a lion prowls around and what a lion looks for to kill? The straggler, the one that's kind of away from the herd, the one that's kind of like, oh, that's an easy target. They, don't, they want to exert as little energy as possible to get as much meat as they can. That's, that's the goal of a lion, and they just lay around lazy the rest of the time, just making loud noises. And so you have now Satan, the, our enemy, He's not looking for a group to devour. He's looking for what? Someone. He's looking for the one that's off by themselves, disconnected from the body, and he can devour them however he wants. They're dead meat, spiritually speaking, and open themselves to attack. And I see this all the daggum time, and I just want to, oh my gosh. I've, I've been in ministry for like 17 years. I mean, I've been doing this a long time. A long time. And I see people show up at church. I'm really excited. Wow, this is awesome. It's Sunday morning, I'm really excited about this. We're going to come. We're going to plug in. We want to get to know people. And then like a month later, they're gone. And I have no idea where they're at. And then I see on Facebook, why my boyfriend, blah, blah, blah. And I hate da, 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 da. And I'm like, you're just letting the enemy just devour you. Because you're not connected to the body that would feed you and encourage you and help you put off and put on. That's what happens. That's what happens. That's what the enemy is looking for. Someone to devour. So, have I scared you enough to stay connected? <laughs> that wasn't my goal as I'm sitting here. I'm like, okay, I'm freaking him out now. Like, oh, it's like guilt. I got to stay connected or I'll die. You know, like that's, that's not, that's, that's not it. That shouldn't be your motivation. Like, like, well, <laughs> I don't want to be the dead meat. I just, so I'll just do whatever he says. You know, that's manipulation. All right, so that's not my heartbeat. But here's what I do know. That, that, that if you are a true disciple, meaning you're really walking after God and you're really following him, you will always be growing. A true disciple does not flatline or land in the pit and stay there. 
A true disciple stays connected to the body and stays connected relationally and experiences that pattern of growth and change in their life and they will, they will always be growing. And there is all throughout scripture language, and I'm going to show you a picture here in a moment, that helps us understand that there are seasons of growth. There is a pattern for spiritual growth. And then there, is, there are steps to go through in that process. We see even in the language in, the, in Ephesians here, the first 14 says, then you'll no longer be what? Say it with me. Infants. So there's this imagery that, that there are infants in Christ. There, there are those who are just brand new. And they're just figuring this thing out. They're like, I don't know. I just know I feel different. I know that like things are changing, but you're an infant in Christ. That's awesome. That's awesome. But then we see in 15, there's, there's something else. There's speaking the truth in love. We will what? Grow to become in every respect the mature body. So there's a mature process, right? There's, there's going from an infancy and maturing in your spiritual growth always connected in community because that's where you will experience the growth you need to experience in community, in relationship with each other. And so I'm going to show you just, this is the teaching part of the sermon, okay? Because I've been using lots of graphs and stuff and it seems like when I start teaching on that, you're like, whoa, you know, like I didn't understand that. But we've used this a lot actually in the life of our church and we're using it more and more and this year we want everyone to understand that this is the, this, this is the life cycle of what it looks like to be a disciple and your growth and your walk with Christ and too many people get hung up on the journey and stay in one place so in the language that we just saw infancy, maturity th- this is what it looks like to be a disciple Okay. so we see here it starts here and it goes around this way I call this the discipleship wheel. Like I could spin it. I can't. But this is the spiritual journey of what everybody goes through. There's a season in your life where you're, you're spiritually dead. Like you're not connected to God. And, and you're, just, you're living for the world. You're living for yourself, right? Like when you're apart from Christ, there's nowhere else to live for. Just you're living for yourself. I love it when people start saying, I don't know, I wanted to seek God, or I, I felt like God was telling me to do something. I didn't know who this God is, but I felt like I needed to like, go to church, or I needed to ask some questions of some of my friends, and I'm like trying to understand this, where people start to experience God pulling them into his presence. Man, that's, that's his grace and mercy. Taking us from death, just living for ourselves, into salvation. That's that moment where you confess and proclaim you know what i know jesus is my savior and that the center of the gospel is that he paid the price for me to be forgiven forever and so you experience salvation you 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 experience this new birth in your life like this new what is god up to and he's changing you that's exciting i mean i love seeing that that's so exciting. And many of you in this room have experienced that probably in the time you've been a part of New Hope, that salvation. So when you get, get saved, it's such a churchy word, you get saved, like whenever God saves you, right? <coughs> Sorry, did I wake you up? That wasn't your hearing aid, by the way. That was the speakers. Um, you become an infant in Christ. Like you're brand new to this thing. You're like, I don't I, I'm trying to figure out all this stuff and we use the word ignorance like you're ignorant about what all the truth is and what your life should look like and so as an infant in Christ you're just trying to figure out what the new truth is like how what am I supposed to do what does this look like and how do I do this whole Jesus thing I don't know but I'm trying to figure it out and this is not a put down of ignorance is a real baby who's actually been born ignorant yeah, they need taken care of, right? They need food. They need somebody to take care of them all the time. You know, they're pooping in their diapers. And, and I tell you what, spiritually infants, they do the same thing, right? They make mistakes and they still are living in sin and they're trying to figure out what is going on. And, and it's, it, it's okay to experience this. I mean, it's natural in your spiritual journey. But you're called to grow, Right? And so to help people transition from being an infant in Christ to be then a spiritual child. And in a spiritual child, we, I put this word here, uh, children naturally, who has kids in the room, are self-centered, right? Like kids are all about themselves. 
And that's natural because they're kids. You know, they're just, they're like, of course somebody's taking care of me. Of course I'm, you know, somebody else is making sure I'm, I'm dressed right because I have no idea what to pick out. And of course I'm, you know, expecting them to buy me Legos and the latest games. Like, of course I'm, you know, like, it's just they're consumers. That's what children are. And, th- and they're spiritual children who, who are self-centered and not in the sense of like it's evil, but in the sense that they need somebody to feed them. They need somebody to help them with new truth. And, and so their existence in the life of a church body would be more about receiving from others. And that's, that's okay for a season. That's okay for a season. Unfortunately, a lot of Christians stop there. The point of the church is for me to receive and to consume and receive and consume and receive and consume. And, and those people, when they stay there, become the most opinionated people because they'll have an opinion about everything that they didn't like of what they were told to consume. okay for a season but what is a disciple supposed to do a disciple is supposed to grow okay so our job as a church body all together is to help spiritual children become spiritual what we say young adults young adults starting to be a little bit more you know active they're 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 becoming less self-centered and they're seeing that they've they've been gifted they can do things they can actually offer things and young adult spiritually become more god-centered and start serving others they're not more about just what i receive now they're saying what can i give how can i serve and they become more god-centered like god what do you want for me it's that walking in step with the spirit thing comes more and more in alignment with what it means to mature as a christ follower as as an as a disciple and that's that's the season of a young adult and then from a young adult to be mature and to continue to mature as a body becomes a spiritual parent. Now, what naturally does a parent do? You can't be a parent without having a kid, right? Parents reproduce. They're doing it right. I don't know. Like, that's what, like, (laughs) parents reproduce, you know? I'm not saying that because I know there's some people that you try to have kids and you can't, and that's not a put down on that, okay? That was just a quirky little joke. So I I just want to throw that out there. But as a spiritual parent... You are now making disciples and you're mature in your walk with Christ because you're already God-centered and serving others and your heartbeat is to help people wherever they are to take the next step in their journey with Christ. That's the job of a spiritual parent. If you're an infant, I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to share my life with you because that's what an infant needs. They don't need like Sunday school. They need somebody to share life with them so that they understand what is this new stuff and you can help them go on a journey to become a child. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, I just want, if, if it makes sense, say yes. 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 Okay. This is what Ephesians is talking about. That we need to move from being infants, being tossed back and forth because of ignorance, or right? being tossed back and forth by every wave of teaching because it's coming and flowing by the deceitfulness of other people and becoming fully mature body. This doesn't happen by coming to church and going. Because that's not how God designed it, how he wired us. Too often, the church has been the place where you come and learn. And then you go and try and figure it out. And, uh, and that maybe the classroom model of church, right? It's going to be a great sermon. You're going to learn great things. Now go back and do it. But if you don't have somebody beside you saying... Let me, let's, let's help each other because I don't know exactly how to do this because I know the ickiness in my life and I see the ickiness in yours. So like, <laughs> how can we help each other, right? Like, <laughs> how can we help each other figure this out? We are meant to be in community. We need to help each other find new truth, apply new truth, rejoice in new truth and experience the, the process of growing spiritually together in community. That's what we're called to do. Growth and change happens most in community when you're in circles with other people, not when you're in rows looking at the back of the head of the person in front of you. I'm a pretty good preacher, I think. But you don't need more sermons. You need a someone. And that's why we're calling this the year of community. Because we want you to have some someones in your life to do this with. But there's roadblocks, right? 
trust, vulnerability, time, busyness. There's lots of roadblocks that we allow naturally into our life. But we need a place to know and to be known. And so let's figure this out together. Next week, we're going to look at, at some of those roadblocks because the tension in this roadblock actually started with Adam and Eve in the garden in the relationship with God where they really knew God and then they sinned and then they didn't want to be known anymore. And, uh, and so we're going to talk about that next week a little bit. Where, where, what are the roots of that? But this week, I just want to encourage you to ask a couple of questions um, of yourself. One, are you willing to do what it takes to be connected? And two, what holds you back from letting others in? What are those walls, those roadblocks from really knowing and being known? Um, God, <clears throat> as we go down this journey as a church and as we put on these new truths, uh, first, just, uh, I don't want us to worry about numbers. I, I don't want us to worry about how many people are at church on a Sunday. Uh, that's, that's actually the least of your worries, God. I mean, you want to see people saved? Yes, that's your desire. Your biggest worry is that people aren't in circles and people aren't being known and people aren't walking alongside other people on the journey of growth and change. So help us own this this year, God. Let this be the year of community in our church, God. And that it would start here. That it would start with me. Open our eyes, Holy Spirit, to the things that hold us back from it, from the hurts or wounds or, or issues in our past that uh, push against this truth, that push against um, what you desire for us. Because we need to trust you. We need to trust you that this is how you wired us. This is what you call the church to do and that you called us into this. There's this passage right here, 1 Peter 2, 9. And this is a, it's a beautiful word from, from our good, good Father in heaven who loves us. He says, but you, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out. You hear that? He called you out. He called you out of darkness into his wonderful Light, And he wants us to walk in that together. We're going to sing a song of just response, of worship. And let's stand together, church. If you're a part of the prayer team, I want the prayer team just to be available um, during this time. Uh, because maybe you know some things you need to set aside. You already know it. God's speaking to you. And, um, and you need to already put on some new truth. And uh, the prayer team is always here just to pray with, about whatever. Whatever you want whatever you see God doing in you. Um, but as we sing, I want you to just challenge your own heart and let God challenge your heart to receive his truth. So God, as we sing, change us. As we respond, form us and mold us. Holy Spirit, speak in us and that we would want your truth more than anything. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's worship. Let's receive.